Okay, so good morning, everyone. Today I will talk about this uh, self trap polarons and topological defects in a topological MOT insulator. And I hope that at the end of the talk, you will understand all these uh, terms in the title and why it is interesting. Um, so just to present myself, I'm, um, um, so I'm a theoretical physicist. I'm working at the Institute of Photonic Sciences uh, as a Lakai Chad Junior Leader Fellow. And actually a bit of publicity, and now I'm looking for postdoc positions. So if you know good like uh, students that have finished their thesis now or some postdocs that would like to work on quantum simulator and quantum machine learning, they can contact me. Um, so the work that I will present today has been published recently, actually last week, and has been done in collaboration with um, Sergio Julia Fare, that is a PhD student in our group. Um, Maciek Lewenstein, that most of you know, that is also at ICFO, and Marcus Müller, that is, uh, that is on, at the University of Aachen in Germany. So I will start with uh, the outline of the talk. And in this talk, I will first do a brief introduction on, <coughs> on topology and discuss a bit why topology is interesting in general, and then how you can also see like this kind of topological properties in, uh, in a quantum system, in particular in condensed matter, and how one can see these phases in like solid state physics and quantum simulators. And then afterwards, I will discuss a bit on um, the notion of topological mode insulator in uh, one of these lattices. But I mean, what I mean by topological mode insulator is like topological insulator induced by interaction. And I will try to highlight the differences between this kind of um, topological insulator and the normal one that is like induced by external gauge fields. Um, and typically like people are studying these topological insulators are like um, feelings that are like, for example, one half. Um, but in our work, actually what we study is like uh, feelings that are like um, doped around half feeling. And I will show that actually it's quite interesting because one can see like interesting effect around these feelings. And finally, I will finish with conclusion and outlook of the talk. So let's start with the introduction. So, so what about topology? So this is a very simple example of topology. So imagine that you have geometric shapes in 3D and you can define this uh, so-called Euler characteristic. And Euler characteristic is like the, um, it's like the sum of the vertices minus the edges plus the faces. And actually one can show that this is a topological invariant. So you can compute it for different uh, shapes. For example, here the cube, and you see that k equal two. For this shape, you would find like the k equal two. Um, but for this kind of like donut shape, this is k equal zero. And so you see that you can classify them. And actually, it's like topological invariant because in the sense that you could like somehow deform these shapes like that have the same value of the other characteristic. Um, but you could not deform this shape into the, um, this shape that is this donut shape. No? And actually, you already see the thing is that here you have a hole in the system. No? And so you could never like deform continuously this square to a system that has a hole. Naturally, one can show that um, this um, topological invariant, this other characteristic, is actually related to something that is called a genus that is um, really counting the number of holes. And like for like continuous surfaces and for continuous manifold, one can also define such topology. And this is um, like this uh, kind of celebrated gross bonnet theorem. Um, but then what about? Um, physics. So actually there is a, a field where there are also like topological invariants. And the field that I will talk about today is are these topological insulators. So the story of the topological insulators began in, in the 80s with the discovery of the integer quantum hole effect. And there, I mean, like in the group of uh, von Klipsin, what they discovered is that by applying a strong magnetic field on a semiconductor that was at very low temperature, um, they were observed that the, the conductivity of the system was quantized. It's like the, the resistivity that is uh, plotted, but you see this plateau that is appearing when you change the magnetic field. No? 
And also this, um, this uh, conductivity was robust against like local perturbations such as disorder and interaction. Actually, like a few years later, it was shown like theoretically by Torles and collaborator that the fact that this conductivity was robust is actually related to a topological invariant. So this is like a change of paradigm because it means that these systems are characterized by a global topological property, um, which is somehow going beyond like from the like uh, local order parameter description of uh, phases of matter in the Landau theory. Uh, in the case of the quantum hole effect, the magnetic field that you have in the system is actually breaking the time reversal symmetry. But it is also possible to imagine like systems um, where all the symmetries are preserved, um, but that still have a, like this uh, kind of um, topological invariant. And these are called topological insulators. So they are called insulators because they are bulk insulators, which means that when you look at the energy spectrum of the system, you will see an energy gap in the energy spectrum. Um, but they are like um, called topological because they are characterized by a non-trivial topological invariant, um, which can be reflected in the quantization of some observable, like for the case of the integer quantum mode effect, this was the, the conductivity. And also interestingly, when you have a geometry with border, um, the system has some conducting surface states um, at the edge of the system that are protected by the topology. And this is a so-called bulk edge correspondence. So there are some realization of these uh, topological insulators, first of all, uh, in solid state physics. So it was first proposed like in, uh, in a graphene, like in the case of the quantum spin on effect by Ken and me. And there the idea here is that the, the spin orbit coupling is converting this graphene into a quantum spin hole insulator. Um, but actually in the case of graphene, this effect turned out to be too small to be observed experimentally. But uh, this really led to like a, a, a lot of work and actually a, a year later, like uh, and there was a proposal by Bernevig and uh, Hughes and Zhang uh, to realize such kind of physics in quantum nanowells. And there the idea is that by varying the thickness of the different layers of these materials, you can engineer both an insulator you see here like the energy spectrum and the energy gap, or topological insulators, where now one see that actually there are like um, new states in the gap that are actually edge states. No? Um, and you can also compute like the conductivity, it's the resistivity that is plotted, um, which is like here infinite, so it means zero conductivity, or here you see that you reach nice scale plateau. And actually these materials are very realistic, so they were able to observe that experimentally one year later. One can generalize also this notion of uh, topological insulator to a higher dimension. For example, here for like uh, 3D, like topological insulator um, that were also observed like experimentally. Um, so there is um, another path to realize this um, topological insulator and it is really the, the one that I'm coming from that are the, these quantum simulators. And so the idea here of quantum simulation is to use uh, a kind of quantum system to mimic the uh, given Hamiltonian. No? And you can do that with different platforms. So you can do it with cold atom in optical lattices or like in photonic crystals or also in quantum worlds. Um, and what I want to mention is that, um, so nowadays and like the topological insulator can be classified and like the kind of uh, let's say recipe that you would use is that you would look at the discrete symmetry that the system has or break. And then like you can look in this celebrated table of topological insulator and superconductor. It tells you like with respect to the dimension, what is the topological invariant that is associated to your system. No? Then you can compute this invariant and see if you're like in a topological or a trivial regime for your material. Um, but actually, there are like systems that are already going like beyond this periodic table. And some of them are, for example, I, I show some of them here. So like crystalline topological insulators that are symmetries that are not taken into account uh, into the, the periodic table or way semi metals that are not gapped or um, like floquet topological insulators where like the, 
topological phase is like generated in due to the driving of the system, the periodic driving of the system. Or also this topological mode insulator, which is really like the topic of the talk of today, where the interactions are actually inducing like these topological phases. Um, just a word a bit more about like, like simulation of this system. Um, there are different platforms in particular for these 2D churn insulators that are like the ones of the type of the integer quantum all effects. Um, one can realize it, for example, in cold atoms via like uh, different techniques, for example, laser assisted tunneling that was done in, uh, in the group of uh, Emmanuel Bloch. Also it can be done with uh, shaking of the lattice which was done in the group of uh, uh, Tillman Esslinger. Or otherwise, something, uh, a concept that was also proposed in our, in our group that is like to use uh, the synthetic dimension. So like, uh, like internal degrees of freedom of the lattice to engineer kind of uh, from a 1D lattice, optical lattice, one can engineer like a, a quasi 2D system. So like a ribbon. No? And, but the nice thing of it is that one can also engineer like this artificial gauge field and it was also observed experimentally. Um, and then there are other platforms where you can do that. You can also do that in, uh, in photonics system, for example, with arrays of wave guides. Um, also, you can do it with uh, like um, um, light also, uh, with uh, twisted photons, for example, like uh, in uh, it can be in the orbital angular momentum of the light or here like it's in the, the momentum of the light that one can also encode this degree of freedom. Um, but then you can ask yourself, what about interactions in these uh, insulators, no? topological insulators? So in general, one, one thing about this interaction, the first thing that one can think is, um, what is the stability of these phases with respect to these interactions? No? And actually, these interactions can destroy these topological phases. Um, but actually, it's not the only thing that they can do. They can also like, um, engineer some uh, very interesting phases, such as uh, the fractional quantum mole effect, or like effect that are like really due to the interplay of uh, this topology that is coming from the external gauge field and the interactions. No? So we can have, like, for example, like quantized, um, sorry. A fractional, <laughs> fractional like conductivity in the system, um, but even more in this is like the, the topic of this talk. Um, they can even induce the topology, and what I mean by that is that you start from a system that, that is trivial, you choose like a proper type of interactions, and then you would be able to observe that by changing like the interaction in the system, the system will grow to a semi-metal to a topological insulator. Um, and this mechanism is really like now that you are like creating a churn insulator um, from a spontaneous symmetry breaking of uh, time reversal symmetry in the system. Naturally, if you're interested in this topic, there is a very nice review that is like reviewing all these points that I was discussing before of uh, Stefan Rachel that is uh, shown here. Um, just to discuss a bit more like the difference between uh, these um, churn insulator like generated by external gauge field or like the churn insulator generated by interaction. So spontaneous symmetry breaking churn insulator. Um, I have this nice table. So, so if you take like external gauge field, um, the time reversal symmetry is broken, but by the external gauge field. No? In the case of the spontaneous symmetry breaking, the time symmetry, uh, the time reversal symmetry is also broken. But this is really due to the fact that uh, of the interactions, no? um, and um, and so one is external, the one is from the interaction, and then you can look at different quantities. So, like, do we have a local order parameter in the case of external gauge field? Not really. So you can really characterize them through like uh, the churn number that is the topological invariant of these systems. Um, but in the case of the spontaneous symmetry breaking, yes, you have a local order parameter that characterizes your phases. No? And also like one very interesting thing, and you will see that this is something important for our work, is the ground state degeneracy. So when it's an external gauge field, there is no ground state degeneracy. But in the case of a spontaneous symmetry breaking, because it's a mechanism where you can, uh, you are like choosing one configuration on another, you have like a degenerate ground state. 
So now let's go a bit more into in depth of uh, one example. And this is the one that we studied of a topological mot insulator, um, in a, like in a, in a lattice that is this uh, checkerboard lattice. So the Hamiltonian that we considered uh, was uh, like proposed like in, in this paper. And um, the idea is that you have like a, a checkerboard lattice with hopping between a nearest neighbor, that is like this T, um, and you have also hopping between nearest neighbor, uh, next to nearest neighbor, but with a, a pi flux here. So you see that you have like variation of the sign of uh, the hopping. Um, and then this model actually has a quadratic band touching that is uh, presented here, okay? Um, and what you can do is that you can add interactions between nearest neighbor and next to nearest neighbor. No? And what we would like to understand is uh, what would be the, the, the phase diagram of, uh, of uh, such a, a material. No? So one thing that you can do is uh, that you can study this, um, this Hamiltonian within a, a mean field approximation. And so to do so, what you do is that you take your interaction term that you have here, like it's density, density interaction. Um, and you do the, the so-called artifold decoupling. And the artifold decoupling is giving you like two types of terms, no? Terms that are like uh, kind of hopping, so really corresponding to um, this term that we had before. So it's like a, an effective hopping generated by interactions, or terms that are density ones, so like creating like kind of density on sites. No? Um, I have a question. Sorry. Yes. Well, you, this applies to fermions. With yes. Spins, mm -hmm. Right. And yes. So, so the anti commute, right? Yes, so the system here is actually spinless fermions on a, on a lattice, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, but the reason, the, 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 the mathematics is that the C is anti-commute, right? Yes, somehow like the idea of this decropping is that you should like respect the weak theorem. So you do this decropping such that um, your, your expectation value would be like fulfill the weak theorem. No? Okay. Okay. Um, and um, and okay now what you um, you can ask yourself is um, um, what kind of hopping at can have and actually okay it's a bit of, of a spoiler of the phase diagram but you you will have that when you you can actually like generate phase, like uh, somehow imaginary hopping like in the nearest ne nearest neighbor hopping that will break the time reversal symmetry I will explain a bit more in detail why you can have uh, such a property, you know? And actually also this we will see later on, but uh, the fact that you have this uh, kind of uh, imaginary next to nearest neighbor hopping is actually opening a gap. So you will go from a semi-metal that we had before to, um, to uh, an insulating phase, no? Um, so what about the phase diagram? So you do this uh, artifold decoupling and then you like, uh, impose like some uh, kind of invariance in your system to solve your mean field equation. Uh, typically people impose like this translational invariant. For example, if you work with this four atom unit cell, you can obtain this phase diagram. So you will have like, uh, like three phases in the diagram, which would be like one that is a kind of a cytometric phase that is like a, an insulating phase. You have also this kind of stripe insulator when you change like the interaction V2 that becomes pronger. Um, and these two phases, somehow you, you also expect to see them in the kind of uh, classical Hamiltonian. No? But what is interesting here is because of the quantum effects, like in between due to the, the frustration between these two phases and like the competition, there is a space for a new phase that is this quantum anomalous whole phase, um, which is like generated by this uh, imaginary like um, um, nearest neighbor hopping. And so what I meant by um, spontaneous symmetry breaking is that in this region of the phase diagram, there are actually two degenerate ground states that are there. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, which are like um, these two. Um, and so it's really like that you break time reversal and you create a kind of a current in this direction or you break time reversal and you have a current in the other direction. No? Um, <clears throat> So these three phases are insulating, but the, the, the question now is like, uh, um, 
why this quantum anomalous whole phase is different. I mean, you can already see it, no? Like this one is like really coming from a kind of a charge imbalance that you have in the system. But this one is really coming that you have no current, that imaginary current or flux in the system that is appearing, no? Um, and to answer this question from a more like mathematical point of view, it's, uh, it's nice to go to this uh, concept of churn number. And to do so, actually, this quantum anomalous whole phase can also be captured um, into uh, like a two atom unit cell ansatz. And so what you can do there is that you can write like your mean field Hamiltonian as an effective Hamiltonian, or that would be like a, a one part that is proportional to the identity, plus one part that is a vector multiplying the poly vector. And um, so you, the nice thing of this is that it's a two by two system. So you can diagonalize the energy spectrum pretty easily. And you can show that this uh, quantum anomalous whole phase is gapped. Um, <clears throat> but then now you want to distinguish this uh, phase from a normal um, insulator. And to this end, what you can do is to compute the topological invariant that is associated to it, that is called the churn number. And like here, the, the recipe is that you take this uh, vector V that is multiplying the poly vector, you normalize it, and then you compute this quantity that is the churn number, that is the integral over the Brillouin zone of this quantity that is called the, the Berry curvature. Okay? And this quantity is an integer. And um, actually, it's a non zero in the quantum anomalous whole phase. Um, and so we had like uh, that when I increase like uh, this interaction, at some point I go to the, uh, these two spontaneous symmetry broken regimes. Um, and actually, these two are characterized by integers that are opposite. So chain numbers one and minus one. Okay. So now you see that it's not only an insulator, but it has something more. And this is why it's called a uh, um, topological insulator. Okay. Um, okay, so you can ask me, okay, but everything here is like coming from um, um, mean field. Is this phase robust, like with respect to uh, um, like um, some quantum fluctuations? Um, this is not a, an easy question because these are 2D systems, so one has to uh, use numerical methods that are like uh, already elaborated. And actually there are like recent works um, uh, that um, have like uh, kind of uh, found the signature of these phases in like um, in um, quasi 2D systems. And so what they do here is that they use this uh, density um, um, renormalization group um, methods. Um, but on a kind of stripes that are like long in the x direction and short in the y direction. So they can do like typically like a, a four, six, or eight unit cell in the y direction. And then they, they, they put the Hamiltonian that we've seen before and they study the phases. And so these are two recent work that are discussing that. And so what they find is that they find that uh, this um, kind of um, imaginary popping um, order parameter is non zero in a part of the phase diagram. And actually what is pretty nice also is that they can characterize the topological invariant, this one or minus one, by doing a so-called pump uh, kind of simulation. So they can really like characterize also the topological invariant. And what you see is that at the final of the cycle of the pump, they see that like the, the charge that is transported is in the system. And one can show that this is related to the topological invariant is quantized to a value that is here like one. So this is this chain number. It's like a way of measuring this chain number that we, we saw before. Um, so this is nice, but everything that I told you is about half feeling. No? So I was opening a gap at half feeling. And so what we focused on in our work is to study what happens like beyond half feeling, no? like when you change the doping of the system. So in particular, we, we took the phase diagram and um, we studied this point here that you are like from how deep in the phase. Um, so we fixed like the interaction of the system like to this point, okay? And then we, we are wondering what would happen like um, um, when I change like the doping. So, I mean, th there are like two possibilities what that one can imagine. The first thing is that 
if you work with the translation invariant ansatz, um, you could imagine, okay, I have a gap, like for the periodic system, no? And then like uh, when I add a particle, I would occupy like no um, state like from the upper energy band, no? Because before like at half filling, I was in the energy gap. Uh, when I add a particle, now I will be like uh, occupying one like uh, extra state. So this is kind of a rigid band scenario, no? So I have a gap and then I add a particle and like the system prefer to, to become again metallic. Um, but actually, this is not what the system prefers. You can have a, another like a kind of a solution where you you would prefer now to to deform your system to accommodate particles within the gap. So you preserve like this kind of insulating phase, but you create like uh, like particles or like quasi particles in within the gap. And these particles, because they are in the gap, will be localized. Okay. Uh, so what's the problem of that? You cannot really study that with this uh, foresight in itself and that I was telling you before. Because this would be like, um, an, I mean, you cannot really, this is like periodic, so you would not be able to see this kind of localization. No? Um, nevertheless, what you can do, um, you can come back to like this uh, decoupling that we were discussing before, like this uh, mean field decoupling. And then you can relax some of the conditions. So we were like imposing like translation invariance, but you could imagine to not impose this translational invariant system. And um, then you will have like a huge set of um, mean field equation that you have to solve um, to find the ground state, but you could do that, no? Um, but one of the question there is, okay, now if I have a system of, uh, let's say for example, like uh, 20 unit cells times 20 unit cell with periodic boundary condition, how can I characterize the topology in this system? Um, so one of the things that you can do is that people were doing mainly was to study like a kind of boundary condition. Like for example, you impose periodic boundary condition, but you put a twist at the, the boundary condition to be able to compute the channel number. But there is also another way that you can do it and you can also compute the, the channel number locally um, by, by using the fact that the system is uh, insulating and which means that all the correlators in your system are decaying exponentially. Which means that when I'm in the bulk of the system, and this was proposed by Bianco and Resta in this paper, um, actually all these quantities are like exponentially decaying. And so it means somehow that I, I cannot really distinguish like within the bulk, whether I'm an, in, um, a system, for example, with open boundary condition or like periodic boundary condition, because I'm sufficiently far away from the edges. No? And then by doing that and by redefining the, the chart number that I was showing you before, uh, one can show that one can define a kind of a local quantity um, that allows one to characterize this uh, global topological invariant. Okay? And uh, I will not enter into the detail of the calculation, but this is pretty useful because then you, you can, for example, compute like the, the local churn number in a, in a ribbon, this one done in this paper, like this is finite size. And actually the value is really quantized in the, in the bulk. No? So what is interesting in this um, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking topological insulator is that you, you really have like the coexistence of uh, two, um, like order parameters, a local order parameter that is like uh, really the expectation value of this hopping and that will be reflected in this imaginary part of the, uh, the nearest neighbor hopping, but also through a topological invariant that is non-local. Uh, although the probe is local, this parameter is non-local no, because it's really an integral over the whole Brillouin zone. Uh, and then, like really identifies like the, the global topology of the system. Um, so with these tools, now we can go to like the case of uh, one extra particle. So you take half filling plus one particle. And what we will see is uh, this uh, so-called self trap polarons. No? So what you see in uh, this plot is like the energy of the system. And so these uh, diamond shapes are the one that you would obtain with this uh, 
artifact solution with uh, like uh, translation in variant um, ansatz. So what you see is that uh, the green states are the occupied one, and you see that now we occupied one state, like um, after the gap. No, um, but then if you do the calculation on a finite side system um, with periodic boundary condition, and you relax this translational invariant, what the system prefers is actually to like create like new particle within the gap. Um, that are actually localized. And so it's called, it's like really creating this, uh, this is like the a plot of the, the density of, um, of the, the solution. And you see that it's like creating now um, a solution that is localized uh, in the space. No? And so what we can also do, because we have access like uh, after solving like this mean field equation, we can compute many different quantities. So you can compute this uh, local order parameter that I was discussing before that is like, uh, the expectation value of this imaginary current. And this is what you uh, are seeing in this plot. And you see that like uh, within the bulk, we see that this is like perfectly like, um, uh, you see these loops that are appearing everywhere. No? Um, but now like uh, within this um, um, localized self trapped polarons, you see that there is a decrease of this uh, order parameter. Um, and actually, one can even see if we zoom that actually there is even a, a sign inversion of the, the other parameter, a very slight side inversion of the other parameter within this uh, um, polar on. Uh, finally, what one can do, and this is what I was telling you before, one can also compute like the topology. And so you expect that for the system where, the, where there is um, no extra particle, here, like uh, you expect to have a, a chair number quantized to the value of half filling. And this is actually what you see. Here. You see like that the, the chair number in the system is quantized, but as soon as you are like approaching this quasi particle, this is not anymore quantized, okay? Um, and finally, I want to mention that the, the behavior like of uh, this, um, this uh, self trap polar round is like similar to things that were like predicted within mean field for, for the 2D Fermi, Fermi about for this uh, charge density wave. But there, there was no like discussion about the, the, the topology of the system. Um, and what we studied a bit is um, going beyond mean field. No? Um, and for that, we use the, the configuration interaction. And to give an idea why it is uh, interesting here, the, the thing here is that uh, somehow this, uh, like the creation of this, uh, this uh, polaron it's actually a translational invariant. So depending on the initial condition that I put for my mean field equation, um, I will have um, a polaron that can be localized at different sites of my lattice. So I can really translate it in the lattice. So you, you, you can already see that uh, even within this uh, Artifox solution, no, I would have like a huge degenerate um, ground state. And one can ask what would be like, um, like the correction, if I take into account uh, this uh, ground state as a basis to compute like yeah, the expectation value of the Hamiltonian. And this would be what you would do in this uh, configuration interaction. Um, so the idea is like that um, you try to find like um, the wave function of the configuration interaction that is um, kind of um, like um, the linear superposition of all these translationally invariant like um, um, solution of the, the unrestricted mean field. And so if you do that, then you, okay, it's a bit technical because uh, these polar ones are actually not on orthogonal. So you have to do some tricks to be able to, to diagonalize the, the Hamiltonian generated by this basis, but you can do it. And then you would obtain like the, the, the energy spectrum, like and the ground state of this system within this ansatz. And this is what is um, presented here. So these are like the eigenvectors of uh, this uh, problem within this basis. And this is the energy of the, the restricted and unrestricted artifact. And what you see is that now, like we have a correction to the energy uh, that is coming from this configuration interaction. And so this is interesting because you are like recovering this uh, kind of translational invariance in, in this system. 
But nevertheless, it's uh, like very close to the energy of the unrestricted artery fault. And you can also look at the, the band structure in, uh, in K-space, like with uh, respect to KX and KY. And you see that at the end, like these states here are actually pretty localized in a region of K-space um, that is somehow consistent to the, the size of the, the polar on here. Excuse me, what is lambda CI? Lambda, it's really a label of the eigenvalues of uh, the Hamiltonian that was constructed in the basis of the polar on here. Ah, so this is just the number of the state uh, from the full solution. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it's really like the number of the state, like from the configuration interaction solution, yes. Um, okay, so this is nice because, okay, it's like a, a lower energy state, but still like it seems to be consistent with what we are thinking, finding in this uh, unrestricted r solution. So no one can ask, we work with one extra particle, we can go to the case of two extra particles. This would be the um, so the question whether we can have like this bipolar on states. So what we studied first is that we studied solution that were like prepared like from like for the solution of the mean field equation that were like totally random, and then you convert to a state like this that is like composed by uh, um, this uh, kind of bipolar on. Um, but what is also interesting is that you can ask yourself, uh, what would happen in the system if I prepare like, um, like two of these polar on solution that I was seeing before as an initial condition for my um, mean field equations. No? And so what you expect is that when they are very far away, um, this should be a, um, a metastable set of your um, solution because they are very far away, so they are not seeing each other. They cannot really interact between each other. No? And so we prepared, like, uh, as an initial guess for the mean field equation, we prepared like uh, polarons at a distance d, no? um, and um, uh, initial one. Then we solve the self consistent equation and we look at the distance between like the the final um, um, solution. And this is the, the plot that is um, presented here. No? And so what we see is that when the, these uh, two polarons are prepared like uh, initially sufficiently far from each other, they don't see each other. And so you arrive to a solution that is a metastable state. But at some point, they start to see each other and they collapse. So they are like, it's kind of attractive interaction. And they prefer to be together to create this bipolar state. Um, so th this is interesting because it's, um, so it seems that the more particle you add to the system, they prefer to go together to create this kind of uh, uh, system that has also like, uh, if I would plot the other parameter that we were discussing before, we will see that it would be like uh, with um, uh, a lower like depletion within the, this region. And so we can really now like go to much more like particles so you had like eight particles in the system and we will see that this solution is pretty interesting. So we will arrive to a ring domain world. So now you see that uh, the system still prefer to like uh, keep the gap and add like uh, this localized solution. And you will find now that uh, you find a solution like this uh, where you have um, kind of a localized state in the density. And if you look at the other parameter, Actually, there is a, an inversion of the other parameter, like, um, like outside and inside this ring. And this is what I show here. So I show like this expectation value of this uh, order parameter. This is negative in one part. And then within the ring, it's positive. So somehow like here, the mechanism is that because you have like two degenerate ground states, the, the system is preferring to like try to do like some kind of combination of these two degenerate ground states to accommodate this uh, localized particles, then going to a solution that is homogeneous that would be depend only on one of the ground state. No? And so nice enough, like you have an inversion of the other parameter, which means that the value of the Chern number is opposite, no? um, like inside and outside this, um, this, this ring. Um, and actually, because of this bulk edge correspondence, 
one would expect that at the boundaries between these two phases, one should have like edge states. And this is actually what we see in the density. We see that now like these states are like uh, with a higher occupation than like in the bulk of the system, like in these two regions. And also these states, uh, as I mentioned also in the introduction, should be current carrying. And this is something that we can compute. So we can compute also like uh, the current operator in the system. And so what we are seeing in these plots is like the value of the current operator in the X and Y direction. And so we are actually like seeing state like moving around like this ring, no? So this is very nice because it means that you can generate somehow edge states um, only by interaction. You are not like imposing it, like for example, by imposing two different external gauge fields to your system. Um, and so we, we also find like uh, other solutions that are metastable states, like for the same number of particles in that, but still it's pretty nice solution because now you can also have like this linear domain walls. So instead of having a ring, you have like two domain walls that are appearing in the system. Oh, sorry. Um, with like different value of the channel number. This is a channel number inside that is one and outside that is minus one. And actually the nice thing of having these two domain walls that you can really see like the chiral nature of these edge states. So like in, if you compute the current operator, you see that in one, the current operator is negative and on the other edge, it's like, uh, like positive. So you really have like one state, edge state going in this direction and one edge state going in this other direction. So it's uh, also pretty nice results. And then to, to finish this talk, because this is so uh, all theory, the question would be, how can we observe these states in a natural experiment? No? So what we proposed in uh, this work, and that was based on, uh, I mean, also our previous experience on this topological mode insulator, is to simulate the system with dread, dressed red bulb atoms. So again, the ingredients that you need, you need to have uh, a lattice, um, with like hopping between nearest neighbor and next to nearest neighbor that you can realize with an optical lattice, okay? Um, and then you need also to have uh, this, um, this pi flux, that is the one that allows you to see this um, quadratic band touching in the system. And this can be in principle generated with um, um, laser assisted tunneling. And finally, you need to generate this interaction V1 and V2 to be of the, of the order of the hopping. No? And this can be achieved with this uh, Rydberg atom. So just to sketch a bit the idea of it, the idea is that um, we will work with a dressed state. So what I mean by dressed state is that uh, you have an atom, like uh, atoms of the type of Rydberg that uh, mainly have like one ground state and one excited state. Um, and what you do is that you don't couple like the ground state to the excited state resonantly, but you put a detuning and actually you choose the detuning to be big such that you stay in the ground state, but you still have a flavor of the, the Rydberg atom. And then the, the second ingredient that is important is to the fact that Rydberg atoms are interacting through Van der Waals interactions. No? And so what you can show like by doing uh, perturbation theory with respect to this um, ratio of omega over delta, you can like compute what is the effective interaction that the atoms in the ground state are seeing through the, this uh, like uh, interaction of the Rydberg state. No? And so this is something that you can compute like uh, in perturbation theory um, with respect to the parameter. But this, this perturbation theory is really in terms of omega and delta. It's not in terms of the interaction between this Rydberg atom. And so you find this uh, kind of formula, um, which is uh, actually pretty nice. I uh, will just go to, to that because uh, it's like really like um, that we will have, um, if you plot this, um, this uh, effective interaction, you have kind of a plateau um, before like um, at some point, like, um, uh, like at a blocked radius, someone like the, the atom starts to, uh, um, follow a different behavior. And actually in, the, in the, the last part of the curve, it's like, again, something that is similar to a Van der Waal interaction. Um, but still it's pretty nice because these interactions are like tunable and they are independent of the hopping because they really depend on the ratio between uh, 
the Rabi frequency and the, the detuning. Um, and then we can also generate in these systems like interactions V1 and V2 that are very strong. Um, and, um, and because we studied in this model with only V1 and V2, we can also like, if we place well a value of V1 and V2 to be here, which is like basically around like V1 equals two V2, we can also choose like uh, the parameters of this model such that the uh, lo more long range interaction would be much weaker and do not contribute to, to this phase diagram. And this would really allow to explore this uh, phase diagram that we have here. Um, so in principle, all these binding blocks are nowadays real, like realizable in the lab. Um, but I mean, it's challenging to, to combine all of them but it would be really interesting to, to see this physics in, in a cold atom experiment. Um, and so with that, I want to go to the conclusion and the outlook of this talk. So I hope that uh, I've convinced you that uh, this interaction induced topological insulator are richer and present richer physics than topological insulator with external gauge field. Uh, I've discussed what happens away from our feeling that the system really prefer to deform the lattice and to create like in-gap particles than, or quasi-particles than becoming metallic. And there is a nice interplay between this uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking and topology that leads to this uh, like for high on like, um, like doping that leads to this interaction induced uh, domain wall. So really edge states of the bulk is something that I think is uh, pretty new. And as an outlook, it would be interesting to study the, the effect of the temperature, how these phases are surviving with respect to the temperature. And this can be already done at the level of mean field because all the calculations that we did were at zero temperature. Uh, it would be also interesting to do a more realistic treatment of the truncation of the interactions because here we consider only V1 and V2, but you have seen that I have like other terms. Are these terms like helping or not helping for the stabilization of these phases? Um, I mean, in the same kind of question, you can ask if I want to realize this phases in, in an experiment, what would be a protocol to like somehow prepare these phases uh, adiabatically? And finally, like there is also the question as whether this, um, this observation that we have made would survive beyond mean field and could be interesting to study them with uh, like the energy studies. And with that, I would like to, to thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Alexandre, very much for a very inspiring talk.